So our theme, so for the last three weeks, we've been talking about the church in isolation. I thought it was an appropriate topic, given our situation. And we started out talking about how we're the light of the world, and it really fit our, our whole theme for the year, because our theme is making a difference or making an impact. And our theme scripture was Matthew chapter 5, 13 uh, to 16. So when we talk about the church being in isolation and how in the midst of that dark home that we're, most of us are huddling in at times, waiting, um, we are still supposed to be the light of the world. And we talked about ways in which we could do that. And the last week we talked about the ways in which we could express our love, uh, our love one for another, and, and how important that was, even in the midst of isolation. And this week, we're going to talk about life. We're talking about the abundant life that Jesus promises us that we just read in that scripture in John 10. Jesus says that I come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Are you feeling it? <laughs> you feeling that abundance? A lot of times, even when we're not in isolation, when we're coming and going and going to work and going to ball games and running our kids to activities and eating out and doing all those things, I have people tell me that uh, they're not feeling an abundance. They're feeling stressed. And others have told me that now that we're not doing those things, they're feeling stressed. So it seems like the key there is stress. And sometimes it steals the abundance of our life and we don't want that to happen so how do we live an abundant life even when we're kind of isolated even when we're limited I mean it's not like we're living in a cave uh, we can still get out and take walks a lot of people have been uh, biking uh, other people uh, most of us have to go to the grocery store at some time uh, we drive places uh, we do have to wear masks when we're in public, when we're uh, closer than six feet to each other. Uh, but we do see other people. Uh, but we, are, we do have that sense of loneliness, that sense of isolation, that sense that we are, are somewhat shut off from other people. Uh, and that can be really discouraging, can even be stressful. So how do we live a life of abundance in the midst of that isolation? So I want to start this morning by talking about what we're learning from this experience. This is kind of personal because this is what I'm gaining from it. Maybe it's not the same things you're gaining from it. I hope that you're gaining something from it. I think that everything we go through, God intends us to take the good from it, uh, find whatever we can, whatever blessings we can find from it. And one of the things that I have found is God is telling me I'm not in control. You know, I never really doubted it. <laughs> I was always pretty aware that I wasn't in control. Not only am I not in control, I'm not even capable of being in control. I get it. But it's been underscored the last few weeks where God has told me, you know what, Carrie, you don't control your health. You don't control your life. You don't control your family's health, your family's life. It's all in my hands. In Matthew 6, 25 to 27, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? This is how he ends this verse, verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Now, I can't see any hands, but I'm guessing there's no hands. Not any of us can add a single hour to the span of our life. And that was true before corona, and it's true after. And it'll be true when this virus is gone and we're dealing with something else. 
We can't control our life. We don't control the, the span of our life. We can't lengthen it. It is the length that it's going to be. Here's the second point, the thing that I've learned from this. I am not the director. I'm not the director. Uh, James says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. Boy, that's really relevant, isn't it? What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. That's all we are. Just a mist. The third thing that I've learned from this, I hope you have too, rich people are just quarantined in larger homes. In Luke 12, verse 15, he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You may not agree with me on this, but I believe that no matter how big my house is, it will not change the abundance of my life. My house is not based on what I have, the material things that I own. It's based on my relationship with God. So we've learned, I think, we've learned some great lessons from this isolation and from this uh, virus that has torn through our world, devastating it. But I have four points that I'd like to talk about that I think are part of the abundance that we experience in Christ. And here's the first one. And, and maybe you already knew this, but I think I've grown in my understanding of this. We've learned the abundant value of solitude. You know, actually, we, we complain about being alone, but there's some great things about having some time alone. And, and the psalmist, David, was an expert on this. Uh, he handled solitude better than just about anybody that I know. In Psalm 119, 148, he says, My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. I looked at my sleep app last night. I got four hours sleep. 51 minutes of it was deep sleep. And almost two hours I was awake during the night. And as I was laying there awake, I was thinking about God's word. I was thinking about God's people. I was thinking about God's plan for us. In Psalm 143, verse 5, it says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. There's a great blessing in having time to reflect on what God has done, to reflect on his works, to reflect on his greatness, to reflect on his wonders. Psalm 145, verse 5, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. I hope you're taking time. The time that God has given us, I hope you're taking some of that time for quiet meditation and reflection, for appreciating the solitude that you have. If you're like me, it's not easy to find it even in this time because, you know, we're, we have like two common rooms that we pretty much congregate in at our house and there's five of us. Uh, so sometimes we have to slip away to our bedroom or to my office to get that private time uh, that we can meditate on what God has given us and enjoy the solitude and the value of it. This is the second thing I believe that should have happened to all of God's children. We have gained a deeper faith and a dependence on God. Once we realize we're not in control, then we, we've got to look to the one that is. And God is that one who is. And we've gained a an understanding of that 
and of our total dependence upon him. Isaiah 26 verse 4 says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. He's that rock that we hold on to. You could actually think of it as an anchor that we hold on to that keeps us steady and keeps us from drifting away. Psalm 31, 14, But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. I know that we're in different places right now, but it'd be great if all together we lift up our voices and say, you are my God. You are my God. And we trust in him. Psalm 62, verse 8. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. He's not just an everlasting rock. He's a refuge. He's where we go to for protection. And at this time, I think probably everybody just about the sound of my voice has prayed for protection. And he is the one to go to. He's a refuge for us. Psalm 56, verse 3, When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Now I hope we put our trust in God at all times. But at this time, there's a lot of things. Somebody said to me the other day, if you're a child of God, you're not afraid. So let me just share with you my feelings about this. I am not afraid of dying from the coronavirus. But I sure don't want to see any of my family die. I sure don't want to see those numbers mounting every night. I, I wouldn't call it fear trembling, but it makes me unsettled. I admit it. And I pour out my heart to God. And I put my trust in Him. Maybe never in my life has Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 been more, have I related to it better. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. The road to the future is in God's hands. It's not in the scientist's hands. It's not in the medical people's hands. It's not in the police. It's not in the governor's. It's not in the president. It's not in Congress. The road to the future is in the hands of God. We need to put our faith in Him. I read the news. I follow the numbers. It's compelling. Um, I want to know what's happening. But I do understand that we really, as a people, don't even know enough about what's happening to know what the answer is. But God knows. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He will make straight your paths. The third thing that we have learned is the, to appreciate the things we have. Now, I always thought, I've always thought I was a grateful person. Um, I'm very appreciative of my family, of the blessings that I have, of technology, of the conveniences we have, of the opportunities we have. Um, you know, I, I, uh, years ago I was in uh, Tennessee in a big city, and uh, we were driving down the road, and there was a Church of Christ. And we drove uh, maybe a quarter of a mile, there was a Church of Christ. Uh, we drove maybe two miles down the road, there was a Church of Christ. And I said, this is crazy. How can there be so many churches in such a short space? And the guy was with me, said, you know, each of these places that you've, we've been driving past are communities, small communities that have grown together. So back in the day when those communities were established, there were all kinds of farmers and other people around and they would get in their horse and buggy and they would ride to the church. And so he said that a lot of these developed because they were different communities. Now they're one community. And these churches are old. Um, and they still have a group of people meeting in many of those buildings. And I was thinking how 
amazing it is, you know, we worship here in Albany normally, and I live in Colony. Um, and so by car, usually it takes me 15 minutes to get here. If there's traffic, which we haven't had a lot of lately, uh, it can take me a lot longer. Uh, it would take me probably a while by horse and buggy. Um, so, you know, I do appreciate the things that God has given us and the way he has blessed us. Um, and I, I appreciate my family and, and my job and my friends. And he's given me a reason to give up, get up every morning. Um, I think that that is un, underappreciated. Uh, walking into a nursing home years ago, I said to the lady, um, I, I visited with her, and then I visited with the person in the next bed to her, and I was kind of in a hurry. Uh, you know, I had a prayer with them, and I was kind of rushing out, and the woman asked me what my hurry was, and I said, I've got a whole list of errands to run. Just like that. I was like so despondent because I had to go here and here and here and here and here. And I said, and that's why I need to go because this is not my favorite thing but I've got to do it. And she said to me, I wish I could do errands. And I realized that what I saw as drudgery, she saw as a blessing. We need to learn to appreciate the things we have. We focus too much on the things we don't have, the things we want, the things we wish we had, but we need to appreciate the things that we already have. James says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, Paul says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, do you believe that the circumstance we're in fits into all circumstances? I believe it does. And so we need to find reasons to be thankful because God has given us reasons to be thankful today. Thankful that we can be here together. Thankful that you're meeting with whoever you're meeting with today and, and sharing with us this worship. Thankful for the food that you're going to eat after we meet and the house and the shelter that you have and the safety that you've had thus far and the clothes that you have and the, the mobility that you have and all that is available to you even in this dire time in all circumstances. Give thanks. Be grateful to God. Learn a greater appreciation during times like this. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. What a beautiful passage reminding us not only of what we have here, but what we have to come. The fourth thing, the clock is ticking. We've learned a greater appreciation for the moment. For the moment that we have. I have enjoyed coming down here every Sunday morning, and Matt's been coming down here with me. He's at the back. And I've enjoyed setting up for worship and knowing that because of the blessings God has given us, we're able to plug in to so many brothers and sisters and be able to share worship together. I've enjoyed that. Would I like us to all be able to come back together again? Absolutely. But in the meantime, I've learned to appreciate this moment. I've, I've really benefited from that. That the moment I have is all that I can be assured of. And I need to appreciate that. 
Over 160,000 people have met their creator during this virus. Most of them didn't plan on it. They didn't plan on meeting him this soon. You know, the thing that's most terrifying of this, when I did this sermon at the beginning of the week, it wasn't even the beginning, when I was doing this slide up, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, it was 130,000. That's how fast the number is going up. Psalm 89:47 says, Remember how short my time is? For what vanity you have created, all the children of man. We're just so plugged into who we are and what we're doing and how important our things are. And we, we fly through life trying to shove as much into life as we can. And God has found a way to slow us down and say, hey, look at the moment. Look at the moment you're in. What in this moment is worth celebrating? Think about that today. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So what is this time for? What is this time for? Colossians 4 verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders making the best use of the time. Making the best use of the time. Not only is life more abundant, I believe that maybe we've gained an appreciation for how precious life is. I'm telling you for sure that the families of those 160,000 people have learned how precious life is. I hope it doesn't take that to teach us that lesson. This week, I was particularly moved by one story. It was about a family, a woman on the front lines of this virus fighting it day in and day out as a nurse. And she contracted coronavirus. Her daughter had come home from college when the college is closed, but she was in the hospital. Her daughter texted her back and forth. And when they believed that there was no longer any chance for her to survive, they called her husband, who is, whose health is very compromised, and said to him, this is your last chance if you want to come and say goodbye to her. And he said, I can't afford to because I have a daughter. That story has plagued me this week. Has reminded me of how precious each moment I have with my wife is. How precious each moment I have with my family is. How precious FaceTime is. How precious Duo is. How precious the encounters I have with my neighbors are. How precious worship is. And Bible studies. And elders meetings. When we meet on Wednesday nights with all the little squares on the screen. We're learning the value of solitude and the value of a deeper dependence on God and the value of what we really have and the value of each moment. I think that our life, when we come through this, will be richer and more abundant because of what we're going through right now. We do not know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. God says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. We have a future, 
And we will come through this as a people of God. Businesses may close. People will struggle. But God's church will still be here. We need to be grateful. We need to realize the value of the abundant life that we have in Christ. Join with us and sing, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand.